I've, obviously, you know, we're kicking off the Star Wars Christmas, and I got to tell you that as a church, normally what happens, and I'm going to let you in on some inside church, how churches operate, usually the whole month of December is given to the Christmas series. Uh, we didn't start till this week. Last week, we finished up our Jesus Is. How many were here last week on December 1st? The reason why we did that is because it just feels like it takes forever for Christmas to get here, doesn't it? it t- doesn't it feel like it takes forever for the Christmas season? I mean, as a culture, we build it up so much that when December 25th comes, it kind of feels anticlimactic, doesn't it? It's like Thanksgiving, right? You spend all day preparing, and then you eat, and you're like, that's it? And so it just feels like, oh, I just got to make it, because it's so long, I got to make it to December 25th, doesn't it? Um, because remember, it used to just be about 12 days of Christmas. How many were alive when it was just 12 days of Christmas? You know, you had geese laying and some drummers drumming and five golden rings. And now it's like as soon as Halloween's over, boom, they're selling Christmas stuff. So it's like two months of Christmas. And after a while, you're like, where is the spiked eggnog? Because that's what's going to take me to get through this thing, <laughs> right? And to top it off, Christmas is complicated, isn't it? You got family, you got drama, you got, you know... Oh, they're coming over here. Those two don't get along. Make sure you don't sit them next to them. They have to come over on Christmas Eve because they don't get along with them, so we'll bring them over on Christmas. And, you know, people are talking about Trump, and he hates Trump, and she loves Trump, and he hates walls, and she loves walls, and he wants to save the whales, and she hates whales. And it just (laughs) gets complicated, doesn't it? And then to to top it off, it's expensive, isn't it? It's expensive. That's why I love, we've been our church partners with Dr. Rich Hughes and the Tyranny family and they do Secret Santa where we go in and they pay off um, layaways at Walmart. Uh, They've paid off, I believe, 60. They find families that have layaways at the different Walmarts and pay them down to one cent. Uh, The families that have bicycles, toys, and things like that so they can tell it's Christmas, pay it down to one cent, and they get a text. This family gets a text and says, hey, you owe one cent. And they're like, what? And they go down there, and it's all paid for. Um, And your giving helps do that. We actually are doing Niceville Walmart tonight. We're going to go do, pay off their layaways there. So if you want to give towards that, you can find out later. But I love that because you know what else it does? Because so many times when we give uh, to the poor or to people in need, um, it takes away their dignity. But you do it in a way that they still have dignity because to their kids, they go down there to Walmart and they're buying it themselves. And that's important, right? So thank you for all those you give. And thank you for Dr. Rich Hughes, who spearheads that up. But it's, you know, it's just, Yeah. It's messy. Christmas is messy. It's complicated. I mean, you got the uh, you got the drama. Hey, Kevin, look what you did, you little jerk. You know what you do to my tarantula and all that. And um, but actually, when I talk about ke- uh, complication, I'm really not even talking about that stuff because that kind of stuff that we've done in our culture, we've did that to ourselves. It's our own fault that we've gotten there and we've allowed our culture to have two months of Christmas. When I'm talking about comp- Christmas complications, I'm talking about the OG Christmas the one in the Bible. See what I did there? I'm talking about the one in the Bible where Mary and Joseph have to go to Bethlehem to pay off a tax bill. And can you imagine if you had to like hoof it up to Washington, D.C. and pay your tax bill in person if you couldn't e-file or anything like that? Can you imagine? Or just go to your hometown? How many still live near their hometown? I mean, just imagine, well, I was born in Fort Walton, so that wouldn't be so bad, but could you imagine no Uber, no Delta Airlines, just, you know, going by foot and to top it off, Mary's pregnant? And she's, I mean, she's ultra pregnant. She's like, <laughs> you know, pregnant, that, like about to give birth pregnant, right? And really, if you think about it, th- if you really think about it, it was complicated, but God, even, God made it even more complicated. Because don't you think that maybe God could have gotten them a reservation in a hotel, right? I mean, he knew this was going to happen. I mean, he knew this thousands of years. There's the whole, you know, lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world thing. All right, that's what it says, that before God even formed the world, he knew this was going to happen. So you think he could have at least made a reservation, right? Because there were prophecies. There were prophecies that foretold the coming of Jesus. And what's cool, what I think about the prophecies of the foretelling of the coming of Jesus, it wasn't like it just happened. It was kind of God's way of saying, eight ball, corner pocket. That way, you knew he didn't just, oh, it just happened. He didn't just bank shot it in. It was God's way of saying, no, 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 this is going to happen. And, and, and there was over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament just about the birth of Jesus alone. And I'm talking specific stuff that, that speaks exactly of the birth of Jesus, which is why we felt this Star Wars series, this, um, in this message, Phantom Menace, it kind of has this Messiah theme to it. Because if you've not seen the first one or 
the, you know, that's weird too. It's actually the fourth one, but it's really number one. You know, episode one, the Phantom Menace, Qui-Gon Jinn, Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn, who's played by Liam Neeson. You're here last week, I mispronounced his name. Uh, he discovers nine-year-old Anakin Skywalker and believes that he is the chosen one of a Jedi prophecy that's destined to bring balance back to the Force. And got a little clip about it. No, that's not the clip. I've encountered a virgins in the Force. A virgins, you say? Located around a person? A boy. His cells have the highest concentration of midichlorians I have seen in a life form. It is possible he was conceived by the midichlorians. You refer to the prophecy of the one who will bring balance to the Force. You believe it's this boy? I don't presume to. But you do. Revealed, your opinion is. I request the boy be tested, Master. Oh? Trained as a Jedi, you request for him, hmm? Finding him was the will of the Force. I have no doubt of that. Bring him before us, then. Like Yoda, rest of sermon I will preach, I will. <laughs> Probably not, right? So, just like in the movie, there are thousands of years of prophecies foretelling the coming of Jesus, and weird stuff, I mean, super specific and pro precise, um, uh, things like, um, uh, in fact, in fact the, the chances of God fulfilling all of these prophecies wasn't just like eight ball corner pocket, it was more like eight ball, bounced off the table, hit the wall, threw the moose antlers, fall into a glass of water, the glass spills, a bird picks it up and drops it into the hole, okay, kind of uh, uh, Happy Gilmore stuff, okay, at the end of Happy Gilmore. That's the chances of all this happening. And it was God's way of saying, hey, listen, I, I'm in control here. I know what's going to happen. I mean, when you read the, the, the prophecies concerning Jesus about the birth of this Messiah coming, there's actually four different um, locations or cities listed on Jesus' birth certificate, if you will. You know, because you and I just have basically one one, one, one listing on our birth certificate, mine says Fort Walton Beach, Florida. But when you read about Jesus, you could go, oh, hey, listen, the Messiah, it says that the Messiah is going to be born in, e in Bethlehem. Yeah, but I read that the Messiah is going to come out of Egypt. Well, I read that the Messiah is going to be a Nazarene. Well, yeah, but I read that, the, that, that there's going to be weeping and mourning in Ramah because of him. Well, which is it? All of them, all of those things. So hundreds of years before this even comes out, before the birth of Messiah, God says, listen, my son, it's going to be so specific that he's going to have four cities connected to his birth. So here's my point. My point is that Jesus came and meticulously fulfilled all of this stuff so that God would know and that we would know that God is doing exactly what he said he would do. And so get back to my point, Christmas is complicated because while all of this is happening, you know, all of these prophecies are being fulfilled. There's somebody aggressively trying to stop Christmas, trying to put an end to Christmas, trying to put an end to hope. You know, while, you know, it's bad enough that, you, and that it's complicated enough that God is, you know, it's hard enough to try to make all of that stuff happen, but now you have somebody trying to stop the whole thing. And so, in fact, this person that's trying to stop the whole thing is the most powerful person in the country at the time. And so what I want to do is I'm going to, you've probably never read this before, maybe you have, it's usually not a, pa a passage of scripture that a pastor reads at the Christmas story, and when I read it, you're going to figure out why, you'll see exactly why it's not something that we read to our kids, you know, on Christmas Eve, um, but I figured since we're talking about the Phantom Menace and how this Phantom Menace tried to stop Christmas, I thought it would be appropriate to read this. So this takes place in Matthew chapter 2, and in fact, I want to welcome those that are watching on our online campus. Could we just give my hand here? If you have not downloaded our app, you can follow along with this scripture. If you download the app, the Shoreline app, it, this, the, all of these notes are on here. But this takes place in Matthew chapter 2, and if you remember uh, the, the birth of Jesus, the story of Jesus, I'm not going to tell the whole thing, but the wise men from the east, the magi, they come looking for this because they had read in prophecies about this coming Messiah. So they come to Israel looking for him, they stop and they talk to this king, King Herod, and Herod says, well, I don't know where he is, but then they call him the king of the Jews, but when you find him, 
tell me about him, where he is, so that I can, kill, so that I can go worship him. And uh, so instead, the Magi, they don't go back. And this is where we're picking up the story. They don't go back and see Herod. It says, when they'd gone, that's the Magi, the wise men, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, that's Jesus' dad, in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. So now we have, see that they were in Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So there we have one of the fulfillments of the prophet. When Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the wise men, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. This is why you don't read this to your kids on Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas, right? How old are you? One and a half. That's a bummer. In accordance... <laughs> With the time he had learned from the wise men, the Magi, then, then was said through the prophet Jeremiah, there's another one, was fulfilled, a voice is heard in Ramah, that's the other one on his birth certificate, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And right now, you're, th- you're going, I understand why we don't read this uh, at the, on the, at the, you know, um, for the Christmas story. I mean, this, this sounds like an, a deleted scene out of Game, Game of Thrones, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, this lunatic king going through the countryside with his army, sending men trying to kill all these babies that are two and under just so they could potentially never be the one that was prophesied or foretold that would be born and eventually take his throne. Now, what was God doing in all this? Because believe it or not, there's, God has a plan here. In fact, there's two plans at stake here, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk about both plans, okay? So I only have two points, so hopefully it'll be a short message so that you can because, you know, I know Christmas thing time, you got things to do. You got to go shopping. You got to go watch He's an Angry Elf, you know, all of those things, right? So I'm going to try to do that, get through this thing. So we got two plans here that we're looking at. And one of them is Herod's plan. Now, what was Herod's plan? Herod's plan was for the death of Jesus. Herod's plan was to put an end uh, to, the, to, to Christmas. His mission was put an end to Christmas because he didn't want a competing king running around because Herod... Even, he was the king in Israel, but he was more like a puppet king because Rome was really in charge. And when Rome would come in and they'd take over an area like Palestine, that they would then place a puppet king, someone who was maybe Jewish or someone of that locale, so that they would rule over their own people. But they still had to keep the, the bidding of Rome. That's why they had the, this tax thing happening. Now, Herod was a very power crazy, hungry. He was on a power trip. I mean, he was crazy with power and to add to that, he was, history tells us he was very short, so he probably had that kind of Napoleon Dynamite complex thing going on, okay? Because he's short, he's angry, he had lots of, um, there was, in fact, there was five Herods. Now, this was, he was known as Herod the Great, but his nickname that he liked for himself was Herod, King of the Jews, which, who else was called the King of the Jews? Jesus was, right? The, the, the one who's prophesied to come was prophesied to be the King of the Jews. It was written in three different languages on Jesus' cross. So you can see why Herod is a little bit about like, okay, I'm going to find out who this guy is because in Herod's mind, there's no room. He was going to force Gump on this. There's, this seat's taken, right? There's no room for you on this throne. So he decides that it's not going to happen, so we're going to kill every two-year-old boy in the region just to make sure we get to this one. Now, it's, that seems kind of brutal, doesn't it? I mean, in our culture, we think that's just, did that really happen? But you have no idea how twisted this guy was. Four days before his own death, which by the way, because he was dying of a disease that caused his insides to be eaten, it looked like he was being eaten from the inside out. Four days before he was to die and one of his sons was to take the throne, he had that son butchered and killed because he just thought he just looked a little bit too anxious, okay? That's the kind of guy he was. He was super paranoid. He wasn't Jewish himself, although he married a Jewish woman and he did a lot of things for the Jewish people. He built the temple that Jesus walks into and it was, and when he built it, he wanted to build the largest temple in the world for any God, so it was magnificent. He built a lot of big things. He had a palace for himself in Jerusalem. He had one down by the Dead Sea called Masada that you can still go to today. And so, yes, he did a lot of things. He put his own wife to death, including her mother-in-law. Don't get any ideas, guys. Including her mother-in-law because he thought that they were plotting against him. 
there was a saying that said, it's safer to be Herod's pig than it is to be Herod's family. So killing those babies was just another day at the office for him. But little did he know that this effort to put an end to hope, that this effort to put an end to Christmas didn't start with him. It actually started way back in the beginning. This phantom menace has been trying to put an end to Christmas all the way back to the Garden of Eden when man fell and the first Christmas card ever was sent out. Now, you might think that, well, we don't hear about Christmas until you get to the New Testament with Matthew chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2. But actually, Christmas shows up all the way back in Genesis 3, the very beginning with Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve fell, when they sinned, God spoke a prophecy about what he was going to do to fix this, I, this fact that death and sin had come to the earth, and the answer was that he was going to send his son, Jesus. And even all the way back in Genesis 3, he hints at a virgin birth, okay, that this, this one who's coming will be born of a virgin birth, and he hints at it because he says the one who's coming will be born the seed of a woman. I remember sex education, the woman doesn't provide the seed, does she? What does she provide? The eggs, right? What's the guy? The dude provides the seed. So he was, that. even in Genesis 3, it's talking about this immaculate conception, Emmanuel, God with us, because this was going to happen through God and woman. So this one who was coming, the chosen one, was going to be fully God and fully woman. I mean fully woman, sorry. Fully God and fully man. You can say that if you want. Fully God and fully man, mankind, okay? Well, uh, what kind of church is this, all right? <laughs> now, in this prophecy of the chosen one, of the one to come, the Messiah, the first Christmas, there is also a prophecy given to the snake, and that's what I want to look at, who deceived the woman, and that's where we find it. It says, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, here's what God says to the snake. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And look what it says. He will crush your head, right? And you will strike his heel. So this idea is that this, he, the, this serpent or this phantom menace, if you would, is going to strike the heel of this chosen one, of the Savior. But this chosen one is going to do what you should do to a snake, Crush his head, right? Knock him out. Now, I get, I don't know about you, but I get these weird text mails, text mails, text, I'm talking like I'm 60. I got a text mail today <laughs> on that snapogram, you know? <laughs> yeah. I get these weird text messages that are advertisements. Anybody get those? I get one from a vaping company. I've never vaped before. I've never shopped for vaping Whatever it is, I do talk about shooting the president, but never vaping, right? That was last week, by the way. Um, and it'll come every day, and you block, and then you get it from a different number, right? So you, anybody, you ever get a, a text from a number that you never recognize, like you don't know who it is, and you're like, oh, I get one every year from somebody that says, Merry Christmas and thanks, ha Happy Thanksgiving, and I still don't know who they are. I'm like, same to you, you know, <laughs> Merry Christmas, and... I don't say anything else, and I'll get it again next year, but imagine if you got a text message from somebody, you didn't recognize the number, and all it said was, hey, dude, by this time next week, I'm going to crush your head. Well, what would you be thinking, right? You'd spend most of your time planning a strategy on how not to get your head crushed, right? You'd be like, okay, what do I need to do today? Drop off the dry cleaning, go to work, not get my head crushed, okay? This is what happens, is that God says to the snake, hey, bro, my boy is going to crush your head. So what do you think Darth Satan is doing? He spends the rest of his life, uh, the rest of his life, the rest of the Old Testament and into the New Testament trying not to get his head crushed. Because remember, originally, God says that this chosen one is going to come through the seed of, 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 Adam, of Eve, right? But as time went by, these prophecies start getting more specific. Eventually, Abraham is singled out and told, hey, listen, out of your loin, out of your seed, will come the nation of Israel. And out of the nation of Israel is going to come this Messiah, this chosen one, who is going to be a blessing to the whole world. So now this phantom menace begins to focus his attention on the nation of Israel. 
That's why one day Pharaoh wakes up and says, you know, I need to finish the pyramids. I want to build a sphinx. And oh yeah, let's kill all of the Jews. Why don't we just drown all the baby boys in the Nile River? Why? Because this phantom menace is trying not to get his head crushed. But the, as time goes by, these prophecies get more specific. And we find out that this chosen one is not just coming from, the, from Israel, but he's coming from a specific tribe. Israel has 12 tribes, and he's coming from a specific one. How do we know what, which one he's coming from? Well, there's a prophecy that says that he's going to be called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, now we've got it down to Judah. He's coming from Judah. But then the prophecies get even more specific, and that he's not only coming out of Judah, but he's coming out of the house of David. That's why one day David, who's serving in King Saul's kingdom, because after he killed Goliath, that's why one day Saul goes, you know, David, you've been good to me. You've, you've killed Goliath. You've killed till ten thousands of our enemies. You married my daughter. Hmm, I think I'm going to kill you. What in the world is going on? It's the phantom menace trying not to get his head crushed. Why? Because if David is dead before he has kids, there's no descendants of David on the earth. If there's no descendants of David on the earth, guess what? No head crusher. Why do you think later on in the book of Esther, this maniac named Haman who works for King Xerxes. Now, if you don't know who King Xerxes is, if you've seen the movie 300, all right, in 300, that king that has all the rings and stuff like that, he's, that's that king. He's a real, he was a real life character in history, okay? Haman wakes up and says, you know what would be a good idea? What if we kill all the Jews? And so they put this plan in place to kill all the Jews. And if it had not been for the quick thinking of a man named Mordecai, and the boldness and the courage of his niece, one of the most amazing women to ever live, Esther, this nation would have been wiped off the earth. And so throughout history, from the Garden of Eden, from the beginning of time, you have this idea that of this phantom menace trying to keep his head from getting crushed. As a matter of fact, if you go to the very end of the New Testament, a book called Revelation or a letter and some, it's kind of an end timesy thing. We don't really preach about it a lot, but it, and it's kind of a prophetic imagery story of this whole battle of this phantom menace and, and this chosen one throughout history, okay? So I want to read you a passage of scripture because in this passage, God describes Israel as a woman about to have a baby. Look at this. Revelation chapter 2 says, then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Again, this is imagery of, of Lucifer being thrown out of heaven. But look at this last statement. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. You should see your faces right now. Merry Christmas, right? What an awesome Christmas story. Make sure you read this to your kids on Christmas Eve, right? And the child is about to be devoured by the dragon, right? But see, throughout history, this is human history, and throughout history, it's been prophesied from the beginning of time that this chosen one would crush the head of this phantom menace and bring balance back to the earth. And I'm not just talking Star Wars language here. And what I'm talking about is the authority that God gave man, Adam and Eve, that they then handed to Satan or Darth Satan when they sinned. And that this chosen one, this Messiah would come and take that authority back and give it back to us, creation, mankind. And so throughout history, this is what he's been doing. This dragon, this Darth Satan, has been trying to keep his head from being crushed. In fact, anti-Semitism did not begin with Adolf Hitler. It has been going since the beginning of time and continues today. And that's why even today you can hear on the news when you watch the Middle East, you got a country of Israel that lives around people that all want to, to wipe it off the face of the earth. And it all started with this little prophecy that said there was a chosen one that was going to crush the head of this phantom menace. And that's why in our story, Herod says, I'm going to kill every baby boy in this region in order that this Messiah would not be born. Why? Because the phantom menace knew that it was fourth and goal with seconds to go and that this Savior was going to be born. But guess what? His plan failed. 
The Messiah did come. There was a virgin birth that brought the one who would bring balance back to the earth. The Messiah was here, and he came just like he said he, God said he would in the beginning, and Herod's plan failed. And here's the last part about Herod. Here's what it says. It continues in verse 19. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. I love this guy. He gets lots of dreams, doesn't he? In Egypt, and said, get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. So having been warm in another dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So what? Fulfilled what was said through the prophets, what? That he would be called a Nazarene. So there's that fourth place on Jesus' birth certificate. Here's the point. Herod thought, that through death, he could put an end to Christmas. But God thought, but God knew that through Christmas, he could put an end to death. See, and that is the power of the Christmas story. See, the devil, Darth Satan, was trying to use, was trying to stop Christmas and use death as a tool. God was trying to stop death and use Christmas as a tool. See, and this explains why this is exactly, it is an appropriate story. It may seem gory and think, oh my God, why are they telling this story at Christmas? But this is an appropriate backdrop for us to enter the holiday season. Because I listen, I know we all want the Christmas season to be about, the, and the messages too, to be about comfort and joy. And we sit in our staff meetings and Darlene, this is her big thing. Is I, want, I want there to be wonder at Christmas, right? We all want that. We want it to be the most wonderful time of the year and the sea of swirly, twirly gumdrops and the candy cane <laughs> forest and it's a wonderful life, right? And it should be. But the reality is, as we see here, there was bloodshed. There was grief. There was grieving mothers. And that had to happen in order for us to have comfort and joy. And even today, as we enter the Christmas season, you know, not everybody is it's the most wonderful time of the year. There's, there's grieving. There's heartbreak. There's broken people. There's evil in our society. We have this shooting in Pensacola. There's just evil out there in the world. And the truth is there's pain. And that's why, you know, in the Christmas carol that we sing, it's my favorite one to sing on Christmas Eve, O Holy Night, it says, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appear and the soul felt its worth. See, death is the reason why there was ever a Christmas. In the dark street shineth the everlasting light, and the hopes and the fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. See, Jesus came to solve the problem of death, and that's why it's fitting that on his birth that was filled with death and bloodshed. Now, the question is, how? How would he solve the problem of death. And this is where it gets interesting because remember what, 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 was, what was Herod's plan? Herod's plan was for the death of Jesus, right? What was God's plan in all this? Here's where it's interesting is that God's plan was the same thing, the death of Jesus. Only it wouldn't be in Bethlehem as a baby, but in Jerusalem as a full-grown man hanging on the cross outside the city for the sins of the world. Not as a baby as though he wouldn't have any choice in the matter, but as a 33-year-old man who would say, nobody takes my life from me. I willingly lay my life down. In fact, Jesus was able to do what Herod was unable to do, and that Jesus left his throne as a man and came to earth to be born as a baby, whereas Herod pathetically held onto his throne as long as he could until death finally pried it from his fingers, which happens to all of us, by the way. And if our treasure is in this world, then death takes us from our treasure. But if our treasure is in heaven, then death takes us to our heaven, to our treasure. And Jesus showed us what Herod was unable to do and that he left his throne in heaven. And here's how Paul says it in Philippians chapter 2. Wish I had some music up in here to drive this point home. It says, God, Jesus, he had equal status with God, but he didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. In other words, he wasn't thinking of himself. 
No, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. And having become human, he stayed human. Jesus came down to this world voluntarily to take our place on the cross. Because you see, it should be you and me on the cross paying the price for our sins. Because the Bible says that this is what the Apostle Paul wrote, that everyone has sinned, all of us have sinned, and we've all fallen short of God's glory. And then he goes on to say, and the wages of sin is death, and that's why we are all dying physically. But because of what Adam and Eve did, we were also born dead spiritually. In other words, we were born sinners, every one of us here. In fact, you and I, we're not sinners because of what we do. We're sinners because of who we are. That's the way we were born. It's like Lady Gaga. We were born this way, okay? That's what she says. We were born like this. It was passed on to us. So if we're dead on the inside, right? So we're dead on the inside. If we die physically while we're dead spiritually on the inside, we will be dead eternally. But if we put our trust in what Christ did on our behalf, we are now alive spiritually now and forever. And that's what God wants for all of us. And that's why he sent his son to lay down his life. But the good thing is death couldn't hold him. So he picked that life back up and returned to his throne where there's room for you and for me. So life comes down to this choice. We have a choice. We can be like Herod and we can cling to the throne of our life ruling and reigning our own life. And just like Herod, tell Jesus, there's no room for you on this throne. And we can be the king of our own domain and to cling to the destiny that we create for ourselves, the power and the fame, the possessions, whatever we want to make life about, pleasures, and say, no, this is my throne. Or we can be like Jesus who came and humbly laid his life down. And when we decide that I'm going to lay my life down, I'm no longer going to be the king of my own domain. I'm going to lay down the desire for me to run my own show. That when I do that, what we find, what I find, is that Jesus makes room for me on his throne. And he invites us all to a life of destiny and purpose. And somewhere in this life, you have to make the choice who's going to be that king. Because the Savior came and he crushed the head of that phantom menace. But that phantom menace is now his job is to distract you from who he really is. And I pray that this Christmas season would be the season that if you've not made that choice, that you would choose life. You would choose him. You would choose Jesus. Would you bow your heads? The way you do that is a simple prayer. And I'm not, I don't want pressure from me. I don't want you to feel pressure from me. So I'm not going to ask you to stand up or raise your hand or anything like that or even talk out loud. But I also want to kind of counter that and say, listen, if you're feeling pressure, it's, it, I'm not trying to, it's not me. It may be God knocking at the door of your heart and asking you to let him in because he won't force his way. And I encourage you, if you because we want, you to, we, we want this to be a pressure-free environment. But I do have to explain what's happening. I do have to explain that when we put our trust in what Jesus did on the cross, that we now have life and we can reign and live with Jesus forever on this earth and even after we leave this earth. And the way you do that, the Apostle Paul said, is you believe in your heart. And maybe that's what's happening to you right now. You feel that pressure, but maybe it's your heart saying, I believe this. Well, the next step is to just say that you believe it. And that's what prayer is. So I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you, if you feel like you're there, if not, don't worry. We, we, we want you to come back with, until you have that aha moment that Jesus is who he says he is. And we believe that'll happen one day. But the prayer goes like this. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe that you sent your son, Jesus, to this earth to die on the cross for my sins. That the reason we celebrate Christmas or the birth of Jesus, the birth of a savior, is because that was the start 
on the way to the cross. And I know that I've sinned, and I know that I've fallen short of your glory, and the wages of sin is death, but I also understand that the eternal life comes through Christ Jesus. So this morning, I declare with my mouth and I believe with my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and he rose again from the dead, and he's inviting me in. He says he goes to prepare a place for me, and I believe it. So thank you for dying for me, Jesus, so that I may live for you. In your name I pray, amen.